Hello everyone, it is Tyrnor as always, and I thought I would like to do one of these videos again. Uh, since I just did a video on the Gron, I thought it would be in theme to do a video on their descendants, the Ogres. Now, one very valid question that you might have is, why is this only a top 5 list? There are plenty of Ogres out there. And true, there are. But most of them have the personality of a wet noodle. A very violent wet noodle, but a wet noodle nonetheless. Um, just as an example, um, if this were to, to be the top 6 ogres, number 6 would probably be High King Mogar, who, whose only personality trait is that when the previous High King asked him to prove his strength, Mogar proved his strength by snapping that High King's neck. And that's where his personality begins and ends. <laughs> so yeah, um, the vast majority of the ogres on this list are ogre mages, naturally because they're more more intelligent and have more of a personality than just me smash. But there is one, arguably more exceptions, as you'll soon see. Without further ado, let's get to this. Number 5 on my list is Gog, also known as Gorgog, aka King Gog, namely the first leader of the Ogre Gorian Empire, which is a character I pretty much just talked about in the Grand Lore Facts video. Now, Gog's story is very, a very interesting one in my opinion, and it shows that he was a very intelligent, well, Ogre. Uh, namely, as I said uh, at that time, which was about 1000 years ago, the ogres were for the most part slaves of the Ogron. And at one point, uh, a group of Aeroquois sorcerers sought out a cache of Apexis crystals hidden underneath an Ogron settlement. Now, because the Ogron were too violent to negotiate with, the Aeroquois instead sought to make the ogres have a slave rebellion and then negotiate with them for the Apexis crystals. So to that end, they selected one of the ogre slaves, Gog, and trained him in the arcane arts. Gog took to art arcane magic very quickly, but surprising very much the Arakoa, instead of attacking the Ogron, he went after the Gron, who were pretty much revered by both the Ogron and the ogres as these sort of immortal deities. And he slew so he slew five of them. And because of his act, all of the ogres lost their fear of the Ogron and the Gron, and the massive slave rebellion took place, which led to the establishment of the Gorian Empire. And later on, as the Yerakoa came to uh, take those Apexis crystals, Gog realized how much magical power was in them, and instead of giving them to the Yerakoa, he refused. Then the Yerakoa atta attacked him and then Gog killed them very, very slowly. So this was the beginning of the Gorian Empire of modern-ish modern ogre society, and my fifth favorite ogre of all time, Gorgog, King Gog the Grand Slayer. Number four on my list is, I think the first time a character has crossed over from two consecutive top whatever lists, uh, namely, in the top 7 warlocks that I did about a year ago, this character was number 6, if I remember correctly. And now, number 4 is Dentarg. Now, Dentarg is probably a character you haven't really heard much about. He was basically Ner'zhul's um, enforcer and loyal servant during Beyond the Dark Portal. He was described as a very loyal ogre, and in the Warcraft 2 manual, which much, well, most of it actually has been retconned since. He was described as the main reason the clans obeyed Ner'zhul because they were afraid of Dentarg. That's how powerful he supposedly was. Now, that's probably not true in recent lore, but Dentarg always uh, charmed me a little bit in the Beyond the Dark no uh, Portal novel for how loyal he was to Ner'zhul. And he also managed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe for a time with Khadgar, uh, only for Khadgar to kill him in Hellfire Citadel. Not much more need be said about Dentarg. I think most of the things that I said right now are things that I've also mentioned in the Top 7 Warlocks video. So anyway, moving on to number 3. 
Number 3 on my list is the Ogre Frog, who is a character that appeared in the World of Warcraft Traveler series. Now, that is a series of books that I absolutely loved for uh, how well it portrayed each individual character, even the, even the villains, and Frog is certainly no exception to that. Now, Frog has a bit of a tragic-ish backstory. Um, in his youth, I guess you could say, he was a member of an ogre clan that was allied with the Horde, and his clan was caught in an ambush by the Alliance, and he was the sole survivor. And as he was about to be killed by the Alliance, he was rescued by the Shattered Hand. And he then became a member of the Shattered Hand Orcish clan, who promptly cut off his hand, and Frog did not miss, miss his hand because he now had a fancier new hand with a weapon on it. <laughs> now, it is a, his story is a bit tragic in the sense that he only had one friend in the Shattered Hand who also died in battle, and then after that friend's death, the rest of the Shattered Hand orcs did not really pay much heed to him. At one point in his life, his story, he met the main villain of the World of Warcraft Traveler series, the human Malus, and Malus sought to recruit him for him to join his group. But Frog refused at first because he thought, well, I'm a member of the Shattered Hand, the clan needs me. So then Malus went to the other Shattered Hand orcs and asked, how much for that ogre? And the Shattered Hand orc said, well, he's only good for carrying things around, so I'll give him to you for 30 silver. As a result, Frog joined Malice and, well, his heart was broken by the fact that his clan, whom he cared about so much, didn't care about him at all. And he has a sort of friendship bond, brotherhood uh, sort of bond with the main villain of the Travel series of Malice. But as Malice began throughout the novels to disrespect ogre traditions and to take advantage of certain ogre traditions for his own benefit, Frog became more and more alienated. And I think the novels portray this uh, well enough, I, I suppose. In that, it's interesting that they gave Frog this sort of characteristic of being a very traditional ogre, even though he, didn't, he spent much of his time with non-ogres. Uh, he cares very much, much about ogre traditions, even if they are not his own traditions, and hates to see them perverted. But on the other hand, um, it took a very long time in the travel novels for him to finally say to Malice, No, you are disres disrespecting my people's traditions too much, I'm leaving you. It, only, it took him to the very end of the last of the novels, so... Yeah, I guess that was that's a bit of a weak point because I, throughout the novels, whenever Malice would do something that disrespected ogre traditions and Frog would object, I kept thinking, well, come on, leave him already, backstab him, do something, but it took a very long time for him to do that. Otherwise, Frog is also a very endearing character in that uh, he has a crush on a female ogre, which appears in the second of the travel novels, if I'm not mistaken, and his crush is very, very ende endearing, how he constantly tries to fight and kill things to, impre to impress her, and he eventually manages to do so, and they ride off happily ever after in the end of the third novel. Uh, so yeah, Frog is the number three on my, on my list of top five ogres. Number two on my list is Cho Go, who is another character that shares Den Targ's dubious honor of being present in two top whatever lists in a row. Unlike Den Targ, though, Cho Go is in the exact same position. He was my number two favorite warlock, and he is my number two favorite ogre. And for very much the same reasons, I thought Cho Go was a very intriguing character, especially before Cataclysm. Um, and much of, though much of his character was developed in Chronicle Volume 2, uh, namely how he joined Gul'dan uh, seeking more power and how he feigned to be loyal to Gul'dan in order to gain more power, and especially his recruitment of the Pale Orcs to the Horde, and how he then became uh, enchanted with the old god prophecy the, the Pale Orcs were babbling about. Namely, once the Horde reached Azeroth and he saw that the Pale Orcs were going crazy because there are old gods on Azeroth, he realized, oh, these Pale Orcs might be onto something and became a follower of the old gods himself. <laughs> but otherwise, like I mentioned in my Top 7 Warlocks video, I thought Cho'Gal was 
underutilized in Cataclysm in that he did show up occasionally as a sort of mustache twirling villain during questing zones, but otherwise he wasn't really present for, say, his subtle plots and machinations. He was just a powerful force to be eventually reckoned with and that's about it. And after his, his death he was more or less easily replaced by the Twilight Father. Um, in the Bastion of Twilight raid, I think uh, Sinestra's death had more of an impact on the Twilight Hammer's plans than Chogol's death. But I digress. Yeah, Chogol is a, definitely a very intriguing character, and I think one that was very underutilized, unfortunately. Number one on my list is Imperator Margok, um, mostly the alternate Renoir version because we don't really know that much about the primary universe version. And the main reason he's placed so high on this list is because of the Code of Rule short story, which details how he came to serve, for lack of a better term, the Iron Horde. Now that short story was definitely notable for giving plenty of insights into how an ogre mage with two heads things and acts, especially an ogre king, and the sort of importance of the Imperator and the Gorian Empire and what the Gorian Empire is really like, but it also gave us a look into how gifted a sorcerer Imperator Margot was, namely how he basically in the short story saw film magic for the very first time, was definitely confused and baffled by it, but immediately was able to copy it close enough to grant one of his warriors immunity to fell magic via one of the rune stones the Gorian Empire had. Which was the main reason why the, the Gorian Empire was accepted into the Iron Horde, because the Iron Horde believed the ogres could grant their warriors immunity from fell magic. And I'm really sad that that plot point basically went nowhere in Warlords of Jannor, because well, the Iron Horde was created by Garrosh basically to be an opposing force to the Burning Legion and to Fell Magic and to Gul'dan. And here's this way to make warriors immune to Fell Magic, and it's only used a handful of times in game and not really that much. Now, admittedly, maybe there wasn't much time to implement its use, and it is known that Imperator Margok was definitely holding back in his support of the Iron Horde, uh, basically planning to break free at one point, but still, it, the, it was the main reason why he was recruited into, into the Iron Horde, and I would have liked to see it more. Otherwise, Imperator Margok definitely has a very interesting personality, he's definitely very arrogant as you would expect of any ogre king i suppose but he definitely represents um much needed qualities of royalty i suppose you could say how he basically explains yeah because i'm smart enough to take this decision this is why i am king <laughs> in short so imperator margot is definitely a very interesting character and one I would have loved to see more, but also definitely I would have loved to see more of the Fellbreakers in general. And this brings us to the end of Top 5 Ogres. Now, if you have any Ogres you like and you think should have made this list, uh, please leave them in the comments below. I'm definitely very curious to hear about them because, as I mentioned in the intro, there aren't that many interesting Ogre characters whose personalities are more than me smash or me and powerful mage lardy dar <laughs> other than that thank you all very much for watching and listening to me and i'll see you all in my next video farewell <laughs>